Hello and welcome to the Nurse Station. I'm Rhea Mowgli and let's talk septic shock. So by now I'm sure y'all are aware of the high mortality rates associated with septic shock. So the goal of this video is to identify it early and then also if we progress or if our patients progress to the point of septic shock, we know how to treat them effectively. So the mortality rates of septic shock were so high that a global initiative was created called the Surviving Sepsis Campaign to bring international healthcare professionals together to figure out how can we best treat these patients to hopefully have good outcomes. Hello and welcome to The Nurse Station. I'm Maria Mobley and let's talk septic shock. So the goal of this video is to break it down in a simple way to understand, first off the definition and if our patients meet criteria, how to intervene quickly and effectively. So the mortality rate for septic shock was so high that a global initiative was formed to figure out how can we best help these patients. So for more information on that, look into the survival, I mean, sepsis campaign. Now, early recognition is always step one. We don't want our patients to get the septic shock. We want to always identify things in its early stages. So always consider your vulnerable populations, right? That could be at higher risk for sepsis and septic shock. You're very young, you're very old, you're immunocompromised. Uh, what about patients with chronic illnesses? All those individuals are at higher risk for the potential for sepsis leading to septic shock. And then also always look at signs and symptoms of infection. We are trying to screen for those things earlier. Our patients might not always present with a traditional fever, right? Our elderly patients that have a UTI, they might come in confused. So you need to be thinking about any signs and symptoms of infection, whether it's fever, chills, malaise, change in behavior. We need to be catching those things earlier and then treating them quickly if it is an infection so it does not progress to sepsis and septic shock. Now we have multiple screening tools we use in healthcare all the time. So let's say a patient came in and they were already in sepsis, or let's say we didn't catch sepsis early. It could progress to septic shock and let's talk about that definition because this can be confusing for my students. I do want y'all to know y'all are probably going to hear SIRS, sepsis, severe sepsis, septic shock, and talk about a cascade. Those are definitions, but I'm going to give you the most up-to-date definition according to evidence. So septic shock is sepsis plus, we're going to get to the plus in a, sec in a second. So let's talk about sepsis first and make sure you really understand that definition. So sepsis is a response to an infection. I need you need to understand it's a dysregulated or uncontrolled response to an infection, like not a normal immune response, okay? That leads to organ dysfunction. So let me just draw a picture. I'm a very visual learner. And let's think about why sepsis is so concerning. So this is infection in your blood vessels, right? So traditionally, right, if we get an infection in our tissues, I get a cut on my hand, my immune response is gonna send help, right? White blood cells would rush to the site and try to fight infection if need to. Uh, platelets would rush to the site and try to coagulate and stop bleeding. A whole That's why my hand would get red and swollen. It'd be painful. Um, it'd be hot to the touch. I might not want to use it, right? Loss of function. So that's a traditional immune response. But instead of this infection, so I drew these purple triangles as infection, being in your tissue, it's in your blood. So this is your blood vessel. This is your infection. And these are your white blood cells. And they identify the infection, whether it is a fungus, a virus, a bacteria, whatever the infection is, and they activate. So, meaning they start the immune response. And of course, they're gonna call all their friends, right? More white blood cells are gonna come to fight. Um, other cells are gonna come to just initiate and protect the body from this infection. So let's think about what happens with an immune response. The first thing I always think about is dilation, right? We gotta get more uh, cells there to help fight this infection. So this is my blood vessel and it begins to dilate. 
So instead of this traditional size that you see here, right? This was the original pressure within my vessels. Now I have a much larger blood vessel, right? So you already got to think about what's happening to the blood pressure. And the most concerning thing, y'all, this is not just happening in a blood vessel. It's happening to all blood vessels. Now, with a dysregulated immune response, remember uncontrolled immune response, the white blood cells keep trying to fight, right? They're trying to target this infection, but what they eventually do is they also start to cause damage to the actual blood vessel itself. So think about that. Then what's going to happen? Isn't coagulation going to occur, right? We're going to try to help stop the leaking into the tissues and we're going to try to help heal and, and, and help those sites. So then all this other stuff begins to form on the blood vessel, right? Coagulation, things like that. And let's think about with, with decreased pressure and damage to our vessels. So we already have a lower pressure inside our vessels. Y'all, my handwriting is horrible. But pretend that says low pressure. Now the whole point is for my red blood cells, right? And other things like that to get oxygen to my tissues. But with this low pressure, with this damaged vessel obstructing oxygen for being delivered to the rest of my body, it eventually leads to ischemia and then organ dysfunction as talked about here. So either that picture helped you or horribly confused you, but I just want y'all to think about what actually happens to your blood vessels. And remember, this is all throughout your body. Dilation, damage leading to ischemia and leading to decreased oxygen and perfusion throughout the rest of our body, which ultimately leads to organ dysfunction. So sepsis is that uncontrolled response to infection leading to organ dysfunction. Now let's talk about how we can quickly assess organ dysfunction in your patient. So for instance, if you're in the emergency department and a patient comes in with all these symptoms, this is called a quick SOFA scale. And what I want you to think about SOFA is organ function assessment, all right? Now, we are categorizing it as organ dysfunction if your patient meets two of these three criteria. And an easy way to remember this criteria is the acronym HAT, okay? So if they have hypotension, an altered mental status, that's two of the three. They meet organ dysfunction criteria. Let's say they have altered mental, altered mental status and tachypnea, A or T. They meet the criteria or they can have all of it. They can have a respiratory rate greater than or equal to 22, which is tachypnea, altered mental status, and a systolic blood pressure less, less than or equal to 100. So that's a quick assessment of how we look for organ dysfunction. So sepsis. Response to infection that has now led to organ dysfunction characterized by two to three of these assessment criteria plus, plus, this is just the definition of sepsis, okay? For it to be septic shock, it has to be plus hypotension and a big caveat to this, low blood pressure despite already giving fluids, okay? It's not just low blood pressure, it's in spite of giving fluids. And in addition to that, we need vasopressor support. So vasopressors, remember thinking back to pharmacology, constrict blood vessels, trying to increase blood pressure with inside our vessels. So I'm sorry, trying to increase the pressure with inside our vessels. The most common uh, vasopressor you'll see in practice is norepinephrine. That's just an example to keep MAP greater than or equal to 65 and a lactate greater than two millimoles per liter. Now, an older definition would say suspected infection plus hypotension or lactate greater than four, but again, I am giving you the most up-to-date definition. So, septic shock is defined as sepsis, which we now understand what sepsis is better, plus hypotension unrelieved by fluid resuscitation that needs vasopressor support and a lactate level greater than two. Let's go into what lactate means a little bit more because I, I truly feel if you understand the why, you remember it. You're not just memorizing to, you know, spit it onto a test and then let it leave your brain forever. So 
So lactate. Let's think about lactate. Lactate is produced in, I'm not even going to spell it because I'm going to spell it wrong, when we have anaerobic metabolism. So what does that mean? When our body produces energy, so our body is producing energy without oxygen. So if we are having an increased level of lactate, our body is creating energy without oxygen, with the lack of oxygen. That's why lactate is increasing. Now, lactate is not a direct marker of tissue perfusion, but you can understand how it can show you if we have a lack of oxygen to our tissues because, again, lactate is produced with anaerobic metabolism, meaning that we are producing pretty much energy because we have a lack of oxygen using anaerobic metabolism. So that's why they measure lactate and we use it, we, we assess it frequently um, while we are identifying and treating a patient in septic shock. So let's talk about your treatment. What we do. And again, this is all based upon evidence. When I say we have literally, uh, I've, now there's an hour bundle to three hour bundle to six hour bundles. Like in healthcare, if you work in the emergency department, critical care, you know exactly what you need to do according to algorithms because we have proven this is what is best to help keep these patients alive. So I'm just going to give you the general gold standard treatments. Step one, Maslow's does not change. If they cannot breathe, you need to fix that. You need to give them oxygen. You need to sustain their respiratory system. So whatever symptoms, the tachypnea, the altered mental status, if they are confused and unsafe, you've got to keep them safe. So we always, always have to stabilize our patient. But this is the hallmark treatment specific to septic shock. So we will measure lactate because, again, we want to see hopefully lactate decrease, right? Because hopefully our body is producing energy with oxygen again. We will always get blood cultures. And this is a big caveat. Your blood cultures need to be before antibiotic administration. And why is that? Do you understand if we give antibiotics and then get blood cultures, it is very hard to identify the pathogen. The antibiotic has already affected those results. And the whole purpose of a blood culture is to identify the source of infection so we can most effectively treat it with antibiotics. So always, always, if you have a blood culture order and an antibiotic order, you get your blood cultures first. That is very important to help identify the source of infection, okay? now. We will administer broad spectrum antibiotics. And this is a little different for, probably from what you've been taught. You're always taught about, hey, get the culture and sensitivity. So therefore we know what antibiotic to give, right? We don't want to just treat an infection um, with an antibiotic that, that we haven't identified the source because we don't want antibiotic resistance, such as MRSA, uh, C. diff, all those things that you've seen come about. However, we will start a broad spectrum antibiotic within one hour. We want the goal, we want it to be within an hour. So less than really. So within one hour, because evidence has proven for every hour delay in getting them an antibiotic, their mortality rate increases. So we will go ahead and start that antibiotic because we know it improves their outcomes. Now, rapid fluid administration. Best practice shows that crystalloids are the most effective for a patient in septic shock. Now there's no evidence as to whether, and I don't wanna say no evidence, there's weak evidence as to whether normal saline or lactated ringer is best. But just know we are giving a crystalloid, whether normal saline or lactated ringer, and the best practice right now is at 30 milliliters per one kilogram of body weight. Okay, so per kilogram of their body weight. We will give vasopressors, and remember the, the one we administer most is norepinephrine to maintain the MAP, mean arterial pressure, greater than or equal to 65 millimeters of mercury. And this is kind of your gold standard. So we want to always stabilize them first. When you think septic shock, shock literally is decreased perfusion of oxygenation to the rest of our tissues, cells, everything pretty much to sustain our life, right? We need to transport oxygen. So that's why you see so much emphasis on fluid support, presser support. But don't forget, we always have to identify the source. That's why it's so important to get our blood cultures and start antibiotics quickly. 
And then we are measuring lactate um, to see if hopefully we are producing energy with oxygen as opposed to increased lactate showing that we are using anaerobic metabolism. And then at the end of the day, you always need to evaluate. We hope to see an improvement of whatever initial symptoms were. So let's say their tachypnea, let's say they had a respiratory rate of 42, we want to see it decrease. Let's say they had an altered mental status, we want to see their mentation improve. Uh, low blood pressure, we want to see an increase in blood pressure. I'll always look at the initial symptoms that triggered you to think, oh shoot, this might be septic sepsis, and then potentially septic shock. Now, we want to see that mean arterial pressure maintained greater than or equal to 65, and this is just your traditional standard. There might be patients that we need to maintain them higher than this. Um, for instance, a patient that had a stroke and it has septic shock, right? We might have different parameters, but this is just kind of your gold standard. And of course, we know we are perfusing if our kidneys are excreting toxins from our body in the form of urine. So we want to main, hopefully see a urine output of 30 milliliters per hour or 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour to just show that we are now getting oxygen to our cells and tissue. We are now helping with organ dysfunction or anything that would have been attributed by that sepsis. So this is kind of our evaluation results. So I hope this helps you understand first the definition our gold standard treatment, and anytime you treat something, we need to evaluate that our treatment works in nursing. As always, we are better together. I hope this helped you, so please help somebody else. Take care.